In science, is there any place for belief? Some have argued that science and religion are fundamentally in conflict, because science is based on reason, while religion is based on faith, which is irrational or even irrational. In previous videos, we have explained what is wrong with this argument. Faith and reason are not opposites, but rather are two different ways of coming to know the truth, and in fact, there can be a profound harmony between them. In this video, we'll take a closer look at the reasonableness of belief within the scientific project. First, belief is important for science because science is a collaborative project. An individual scientist can only test a very limited number of hypotheses, even if she spends her whole life in pursuit of scientific truths. While there are examples of scientists who made a remarkable number of discoveries, for example Newton, even their contributions pale in comparison with our complete body of scientific knowledge. This body of knowledge is continuously expanded and improved upon by millions of scientists. At any one time, hundreds of scientists could be working on a single question, such as, how do planets form? In fact, I am one of those hundreds of scientists for this particular question. And we need many scientists because this question can be split up into many different sub-questions, such as, why did Mars end up so much smaller than Earth? And why is Jupiter, the largest planet in our solar system, located exactly where it is? These two sub-questions turn out to be related, and astronomers trying to understand Mars's origins will need information from the scientists trying to understand Jupiter's origins, and vice versa. They exist within a larger network of astrophysical research, where new discoveries are continuously shared and used to verify or disprove other hypotheses or inspire new ideas. Within such research networks, the individual scientist doesn't typically take the time to verify the conclusions drawn by other scientists. This doesn't mean that scientists trust other scientists' work blindly or irrationally. Irrational belief is as bad in science as it is in religion. In science, unfortunately, both mistakes and dishonesties sometimes crop up. Mistakes are especially common. Scientists know this, and so we're all taught to watch out for red flags signaling an error, like results that are internally inconsistent or that disagree with a well-tested theory. Likewise, opaque descriptions of experiments or observations or models would all cause a good scientist to question a colleague's result rather than to trust it. But absent such red flags, a scientist's natural disposition is usually to trust the results obtained by the surrounding scientific community and to build her own scientific pursuits on them. This belief in the integrity of other scientists' work is reasonable. Without it, very little progress could be made. Scientists also rely on information handed down to them from previous generations of scientists. This is precisely what happens in university science courses. Here, belief in the teaching authority of the instructor is crucial. Of course, a good teacher will explain to a student why a certain theory makes sense and what other theories or empirical observations it derives from. But in the end, a student needs to trust the teacher's wider knowledge of the subject. This belief shouldn't be blind. Teachers themselves make mistakes. But if they are good teachers, it is reasonable to trust them. Most scientists also go through a multi-year process of apprenticeship during their doctoral studies. This could involve something as concrete as learning how to use an astronomical telescope to obtain the sharpest astronomical pictures, or something more abstract, like learning how to prioritize between different ideas and questions when choosing what aspect of a problem to address. In both cases, the doctoral student needs to trust the thesis advisor to become an accomplished scientist himself. More fundamentally, scientists believe in an ordered and intelligible universe. Indeed, some scientists take this belief to an extreme and think that all known laws in physics can be unified into a single theory from which everything else flows. Whether or not this is true, 
The scientific method presupposes a high degree of order in the universe. Remember that the scientific process relies on repeatability. That is, if the same experiment is performed under the same conditions, we should see the same outcome. The scientific project also relies on the possibility of formulating theories that describe general phenomena. Both of these fundamental aspects of science require an ordered and intelligible universe. Perhaps most fundamentally of all, scientists need to believe in the power of their minds, endowed with the light of reason to guide them towards the truth. The scientific process applied to an individual scientific problem relies on a dialogue between the scientist and the nature she is observing or experimenting on, and on the accurate recording and interpretation of the outcome of this dialogue. This is the work of reason. If we do not trust that our reason can recognize when a theory fits or doesn't fit the data, then the whole scientific process is dead. Scientists generally place a lot of trust in their own reason, as well as that of their fellow scientists. If we believe our rational souls are specifically created by God to pursue and recognize truths, then this trust in reason is readily defensible. For non-theists, the origin of this belief in reason is somewhat more mysterious. An evolutionary process focused on the survival and procreation of the fittest may develop mental processes that are useful, but not necessarily ones that are aimed at truth. To conclude, belief is essential for the scientific project. Without belief in the integrity of the work of other scientists, in the right authority of teachers and advisors, in the orderliness and intelligibility of nature, and in the alignment between our reason and truth, there would be no science. For readings, podcasts, and more videos like this, go to Aquinas101.com. While you're there, be sure to sign up for one of our free video courses on Aquinas. And don't forget to like and share with your friends, because it matters what you think.